Welcome back everyone to the State of the Nation. The new conflict that broke out in Israel is creating a lot of uncertainty in the business world, uh, more importantly in the oil markets. Global oil prices have spiked since uh, fighting erupted between Israel and Hamas amid speculation about how the conflict could affect energy production in the Middle East. Let's once again uh, bring in economist Imran Furkan, who's uh, at the data board. Imran, Imran uh, thank you for once again being here. Now, what's the latest on the oil prices? Do you think the conflict in Israel will have an impact on the prices? And if so, uh, what's going to happen here? Um, what's going to be uh, in store for Sri Lanka? Um, well, the good news, uh, Mahesh, is that uh, while prices went up in the first few hours, um, you know, after the uh, first few days of uh, fighting, um, it has kind of stabilized at where it was before, um, you know, the initial attacks. However, Bloomberg uh, uh, economics says that if there is a full-fledged conflict, prices could go up to $150, and then the world could tip to uh, a recession. Um, and we have, well, you know, we have to worry about the Middle East quite a lot because if you look at uh, where our worker remittances are coming significant amount is coming from Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, the basically the Middle East, right? Um, and uh, even more uh, worryingly, um, if you look at the number of workers who, who've left in the you know, first half of this year, um, and the September numbers will come soon, uh, you see that 76% have been to the Middle East. Uh, there are only 8,000 uh, people, apparently around 8,000 in, in Israel, but I think quite the larger Middle East is a concern. And how bad can it get? Well, uh, I don't know whether you were, uh, I think you and I were uh, awake, but, uh, sorry, uh, you and I were uh, alive, uh, but quite a few other people may have not been uh, alive um, during the first go Gulf War, right? Uh, that was in 1991. Yeah. And during that period. Was not born. Uh, <laughs> quite a few people have <laughs> not won, but uh, you know, during that war, Sri Lanka suffered quite uh, significantly, right? Uh, up to four percent. That's the uh, thing, Imran, because uh, these uh, wars are occurring not in uh, this part of the region, not in Asia, but in, but in the Middle East. And uh, is there a lesson to be learned here? Because if we are banking so much in this region for our economy, should we just keep piling up more people onto that area or actually look at other regions, perhaps like China, uh, you know, Japan and, and, you know, this part of the world where, where, where there is, and also a market which we are not even touching, Africa, South America, those kinds of markets. Do you think it will be prudent right now for us to keep thinking uh, on that side of things. No, agreed completely. I, I think we should have learned something from the 1991 Gulf War. We had so many people in the Middle East and we still have so many people in the Middle East. I think the first place to invest is in Sri Lanka. I think if we can get our macro env environment right, I think we'll get a lot more people come back to the country. And in addition to that, the areas that you mentioned, right, um, Africa is a growth market and also, you know, China, Japan and other parts of the world as well. So I think the key is to invest in ourselves, preferably, yeah. but in more safer places because you've got to learn from the past. Absolutely. Uh, the thing, the key thing that I got from what you just said is that we haven't learned anything, have we, as a nation? We keep repeating the same thing over and over again. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's leave it at that. Here. Economist Imran Prabhakar, thank you very much. Now, more on the economy uh, front. As you know, Sri Lankan government officials uh, worship the ground that the IMF walks upon in order to fix our broken economy. It will undoubtedly fail in the future and just like the last 16 times, the IMF will wash their hands from the debacle while you and I continue to suffer. While there are many other alternatives we as a nation could be looking into, the attempt to let the IMF dictate our financial recovery is absolutely questionable and more importantly, dangerous. Let's get a different perspective and for that, let's uh, cross over to Paris, France, where world-renowned economist Professor William Lezonic is standing by. Professor, um, it's an honor, Professor, indeed, to speak to you and uh, hear your thoughts about the best path forward for an economically in crisis nation like Sri Lanka. So, right now, our leaders are telling our people that there's no other way than the IMF. Mind you, so the IMF is currently implementing the same policies they implemented in the past 16 times uh, that have not helped our, uh, or stop our nation from uh, going bankrupt. Now, in your opinion, how must we as a nation think about our economic recovery? Okay, Mahish, that's uh, an excellent question. And uh, what we have to recognize is that this is nothing new with the IMF. It's been doing it for decades. Uh, companies get into financial difficulty, however that occurs, and then it's the people who have to pay. So it's austerity. It's it's what many countries are doing without the IMF when they get into financial difficulty. 
And that's the opposite of what you need to get out of financial difficulty. What you have to do is uh, create uh, basically uh, food supply, employment, uh, safety, health, education for, for the population so that they can actually generate the revenues going forward through jobs uh, that can keep the company, country going and that, in fact, are sustainable because they can do those jobs day after day after day, uh, year after year after year, and uh, gradually increase their productivity and not get into the same uh, uh, problem of debt, a, a cycle of debt. Um, if you don't do that, it's going to recur again and again and again. And that's why it's happened, I guess, in the case of Sri Lanka, uh, 16 times. Uh, so obviously it has not worked. Absolutely, sir. So another avenue we need to uh, rethink is our investment portfolios like uh, foreign direct investments. Right now, there's the risk since Sri Lanka needs the dollars. We would sell our soul to any mega corporation worldwide just to gain a small profit. Now, in your opinion, how should our investment portfolios be cons uh, considered right now, especially to ensure that the economy of Sri Lanka benefits and not the multi-global superpowers? Yeah, well, that requires uh, a lot of uh, political leadership, uh, a um, rather than uh, people who are there to become what I've called in other contexts predatory value extractors. Uh, Mahish, we need to have uh, what I call progressive uh, value creators. Uh, that is, uh, people create value and they get the benefits of that value. Now, how do you do that? That's that's that is the problem of economic development. And certainly you need infrastructure. Uh, Sri Lanka, as I understand it, I'm not an expert on Sri Lanka. I know only what I uh, have read about Sri Lanka, but it has a uh, reasonable infrastructure to start, you know, to build a uh, prosperous economy. Uh, it needs to uh, use that infrastructure to start uh, producing goods uh, that it can sell around the world. Now, unfortunately, if you are producing goods that everybody else can produce, uh, commodities, uh, and this is usually the case with agricultural products, uh, they're li likely to be subject to price swings and uh, new sources of supply. Uh, so that cannot be the only thing that you can have to sustain you, but it actually can be very important uh, to get to a manufacturing stage. Now at that point, uh, there's all kinds of new opportunities uh, in the world uh, for manufacturing and being uh, uh, successful in manufacturing. It's not going to occur overnight, but if you don't start now, it will never start. Uh, to have uh, goods that actually can be upgraded over time. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, a path that Sri Lanka has to take. I mean, there, if you uh, follow the example of Taiwan and uh, 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 Korea, Singapore, in different ways, you see that uh, they were very, very... Uh, poor countries actually uh, four decades ago and uh but went on a different path and even though just to give an example in 19 uh the the financial crisis 1997 a country like korea was in debt to the world uh it was able to get out of that debt fairly quickly uh because it had some manufacturing capability in fact it turns a lot of manufacturing capability uh to sustain it so that's the path that uh, sri lanka has to figure out how to follow Absolutely. Now, sir, uh, finally, in your book, uh, Predatory Value Extractions, which uh, became a bestseller, you argue about sub uh, sustainable prosperity for all, not just the super corporations. Now, what can a country like Sri Lanka learn from that theory? Yes, yes, Mahesh. Well, that's a, a very uh, important part of the, the answer to that is that where predatory value extraction occurs, um, it... Uh, uh, the, the the types of predatory value extraction that I wrote about actually are from very successful uh, country uh, 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 companies in in one of the world's most successful economies, the United States. But nevertheless, uh, the uh, lesson is the same, and that is they what is being extracted is the work of the people, and what uh, uh, has made the United States successful and those companies successful uh, uh, is because in fact, as those companies grew, they shared the gains of that growth with their employees and also with the government that invested in infrastructure. 
And that's true no matter what level of development you're at. Uh, and it really echoes what I just said before. Uh, if you have uh, production, it has to be shared with the people who do the production. It has to be what I call progressive value creation. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're not uh, going to get to the next stage of development. And at each stage of development, you have to watch out for the predatory value extractors, the people who come in having uh, contributed very little, if anything, to the value creation process, who turn around and say, oh, that is my all my doing, that is all mine. And that might be local leaders, it might be global corporations. Uh, but those those are the enemy of economic development, the uh, enemy of sustainable prosperity. Absolutely. So we have to leave it at that. Uh, that uh, it has been an honor to speak to you uh, once again and get your take on our current economic predicament. Thank you very much. That was world renowned economist Professor William Lezonik.